first time I got in touch with a hacker, I didn't really know I was getting in touch with a hacker. I was campaigning against electronic voting, and through that I met a Dutch man called Rob Honkrijp. And um, I didn't know much about him. I knew that his campaign against electronic voting machines in the Netherlands had been very successful. And he was on hand to share expertise with us in the UK. And in fact, we ended up, um, we ended up uh, winning that campaign here in the UK as well. So that was great news. But it wasn't until I arranged to meet Rob at the Chaos Communications Congress in Berlin in 2009 that the full um, power and excitement surrounding the movement really opened up to me. Um, that, that was really kind of the first time that I realised that um, this was a movement or at least a bunch of people that could, um, in terms of their potential to change society and to be remembered by history, um, rival the sort of hippie movements of the 1960s in terms of what they the, the, the better life that they dreamed of, the tools and the ideas that they had to make that better life possible. There is definitely a sort of idealism around hacking and it's this idea that uh, information must flow no matter what, uh, you know, that, that morality is not put on the information. What's, what's important is that it just flow freely and I think that's, a, that's not so much about hackers but that's more technology uh, idea. It, it's, a, it's an enlightenment idea actually, you know, it comes from the enlightenment, this idea that we must pursue, pursue truth as far as it goes and that we must, um, we must allow, uh, the only way we can kind of get to truth is that, is that all views must be able to be expressed and sort of in that battle we come to the best approximation of, of the truth. They understand code, and increasingly our whole society is built on an infrastructure of computer programming code. And it reminds me a bit of, um, in the Middle Ages, there was this great battle around um, translating the Bible out of Latin into the common language, and priests didn't want that to happen. They wanted to have the exclusive, you know, the exclusive word, for, word of God, and they didn't want the common people to be able to read the Bible. So they were very much against people knowing uh, the code. Um, and, and, and that's, I think, why governments are very frightened of hackers, because, because hackers know code, and they can understand it, they can look through it, they can start to, you know, they, they, they're in a very powerful position now, because they're sitting on top of this knowledge on which all of our infrastructures increasingly run. I wish they were uh, better at working with other groups who aren't, who aren't hackers. So, I mean, there's a, there's a real natural affinity between hackers and journalists, particularly investigative journalists. But, um, and, and, certain, and that's what I was, um, you know, that was kind of what I was trying to do with the hackers that I knew. Um, but they're very difficult to get along with. <laughs> and um, I guess for the same reason they become hackers, like that's one of the, one of the issues, is that they, they have their own idea about what should be published and why. The problem with them was this, uh, was this amorality. Uh, it was this idea that just uh, loosening, just like throwing a bunch of data out onto the network was suddenly going to solve human problems. It's one thing to organize yourself with people who think exactly like you, who have exactly the same values, but how do you organize with people who don't, who are totally different, who have different values? And that's where you come into, um, you know, social skills and cooperation and politics and, and the flow of power, like how do we, how do we stop power um, like concentrating to itself and then abusing um, others. And, and the hackers don't have any answer on that. Um, and, and, that and, and not only do they not have an answer on that, they very much seemed to be uh, living a different ideology than what they preached. So, not, not all of them, but, but if you look at kind of the more anarchic type of hacker groups like Anonymous or Lulsec, in, in their makeup, they're incredibly hierarchical. They're very like patriarchal, very masculine. Um, they have these really, I think, very old-fashioned ideas about strength, you know? And it's all a kind of male insecurity around power and strength. And for me, you know, I'm looking for the revolution to be egalitarian, to be democratic, to be open. Um, 
for power to be decentralized. So what are these guys doing? You know, they're basically uh, they're preaching one set of values and living exactly the opposite. So I think they need to do a bit of soul searching and really think, well, if I'm into free speech, um, I can't go around threatening to dox people who I don't agree with. You, you know, that's just not how <laughs> you, you can't you can't practice one thing and preach another. I don't think there's a central committee saying what everyone should think and do. And I do think that means that you will get these sorts of com compromises or uh, co uh, contradictions. And you'll also get a very broad church. And a movement isn't successful unless it's a broad church. I think the Occupy movement is a very similar thing to this. I think people have, they can grasp at what might need to change, but they're going to get there in stages, they're going to get there incrementally. Almost like one would develop a program, you know, they're going to get there in an agile manner, right? And it's not going to be driven by a central core ideology decided by some writer or some, you know, thinker or some committee. It's going to be driven by what works.